Alright, so this inverted lecture video is going to focus on SN2 versus SN1. We're going to talk in a little more detail about how to predict when one is favored over the other, and then we'll do some practice problems together. Before we get to that point, let me just compare the two transition states and energy diagrams because this brings up one last point. And that's known as the hammond leffler postulate, and it relates the energy of the transition state, so just Ts, to the structure of the transition state. And remember, the transition state is our highest energy point in the reaction, so the top of the energy diagram. And an SN2 reaction occurs in one step. And we also want to keep in mind here, RDS stands for Rate Determining Step. So when we talk about the energy of the transition state, what we mean specifically is of the Rate Determining Step. Okay, So we want to look at the Rate Determining Step ter transition state structure. And so in the SN2, we have one step, and it goes downhill, and so that's considered exothermic, and we have learned this before. And then if we look at the SN1 reaction, an SN1 reaction occurred over three steps, but the first step had the highest energy barrier. So the first step is the rate determining step, and I put a box around it. And if we just focus on the first step, we start here and we go to here, and so that's uphill, and so that's endothermic. And basically what the hammond leffler postulate is saying is the structure of this transition state is going to most resemble what it's closest in energy to. So it's closest in energy to this structure, which is the carbocation. Whereas in an SN2 reaction, the transition state is closest in energy to starting materials. So that's saying the bonds haven't quite yet formed yet, and here it's saying the bonds have mostly broken. And so if these are the slow steps of each reaction, and we want to speed up the reaction, we want to lower this energy. And basically what this is saying here is if we can stabilize the transition state, you have to, you can decrease delta G um, double dagger, which is the energy of that transition state. So if we can decrease this delta G, we're going to have faster reactions in each case because we're going to have lower energy barriers. And so that's the goal over these next few slides, is how can we lower the energy barrier for SN2 and how can we lower the energy barrier for SN1. So we're going to start with SN2. For SN2, the key things to look at is you want a good nucleophile. Your leaving group has to be primary, primary or secondary. And we're going to favor what are called polar aprotic solvents. And um, I'll describe that more when we get to that. So we want these three things to be SN2. So if we focus on the nucleophile, we prefer to have a negative charge versus neutral if we're talking about the same atom. And so, for instance, we would rather RO- minus than ROH because the negative charge is favored over neutral. We want it to be basic. And remember that a strong base um, has a weak conjugate acid because it's a strong, weak relationship. And so the RO- minus which we call an alkoxide, is a stronger base than the negative charge on this, which is basically a carboxylic acid anion, or called acetate. So an alkoxide is better than an acetate. Um, and basically we want to look at the pKa of the conjugate acid. So the conjugate acid of an alkoxide, let me just come over here, is ROH versus the conjugate acid of an acetate, which is RCO2H. And this was in chapter 3. This is an alcohol, the pKa of an alcohol. 
was in the 16 to 18 range, and this is a carboxylic acid, and the pKa is in the 4 to 5 range. And so we want the higher pKa of the conjugate acid is going to be weaker acid, stronger base. Okay, so we can use those arguments. We, we also want it to not be bulky where the nucleophilic atom is, and so we have O minus and O minus, but in this case the O minus is next to methyl, and in this case the O minus is next to a carbon with three methyls attached. And so this one is a lot larger in size than this, and it's right next to the negative charge. So basically what we have is CH3O minus versus three CH3s attached to a carbon next to an O minus. And so this is worse. This is, this is a lot of bulk, if I circle it, right next to the charge, where this is a small amount next to the charge, and you prefer this case. And then the last characteristic is if, a col if you're looking down the column in the periodic table, you want the larger size because of a term known as polarizability. So even though I minus is going to be larger than Br minus, okay, if I just show the electron clouds, what polarizability means is that you can more easily distort this electron cloud to fit the shape needed for SN2. So for instance, if I have my leaving group here, because the iodide have a, has a very large cloud, it can kind of form to the shape needed to displace that leaving group. Okay, whereas the bromide would have a harder time, so iodide can better fit the shape to attack. And so, if we're looking down a periodic table, we want the larger size as the better nucleophile. So you have all four of those characteristics. Okay, that's the first point. The second point is we want primary or secondary leaving group only. We can't have tertiary, and we can't have what's called neopental. Neopental means you have a primary leaving group, but it's next to a quaternary carbon. And so let's look at the buildup first. If we just have methyl, methyl is considered no substitution. It is easy for a nucleophile to attack. If we have primary, our leaving group is attached to a carbon that's attached to one other carbon. Our nucleophile can attack, and it can attack for secondary too. But if we skip over here to tertiary, we have three groups here, and the nucleophile cannot come in a straight line. And so this is not favored. The nucleophile cannot just move around at these angles to attack. It has to be able to come from a straight line attack. And if we look at neopental, we see that our leaving group here is primary, but next to it we have a carbon attached to four other carbons. And so it's actually a very large group and it prevents the attack in the nucleophile. Okay. So for SN2 we need primary or secondary leaving group only. And the last characteristic is the solvent, which is Polar aprotic is favored, and so we had talked before about polar means that you have a net dipole, and aprotic means that you do not have an NH or an OH, and so you cannot have hydrogen bonding. And so if we picture our nucleophile down here as X minus, we don't want water, because water could hydrogen bond to our nucleophile, and this is unfavorable. Okay, So we want usually one of four solvents, acetone, DMSO, DMF, or HMPA. These are all good solvents for SN2, and basically they solvate the cations. So, for example, one of the nucleophiles we have is NaOH, so sodium hydroxide, which is Na plus and OH minus. The OH is actually our nucleophile, and so we don't really want the sodium nearby because it can coordinate with our nucleophile. So what these solvents do, if I just abbreviate them as S, they can coordinate to our sodium through what's called an ion-dipole interaction, and it sequesters the sodium, leaving our OH minus 
freer to attack. And that's what you want as a nucleate foul. You, you want a nucleate foul that's free to attack and you will have a good SN2 reaction. And just to show you where polar A product solvents fall, as solvents go, you're either polar or nonpolar. Nonpolar hexanes and benzene, oh, sorry, benzene, can just contain CH bonds. And we had learned that CH bonds are not polar. So we want polar solvents. So we're going to learn polar protic in our next topic, and then polar A protic, which we're talking about on this slide. Okay. So those are the factors that favor SN2. Let's talk about the factors that favor SN1, and they're kind of complementary to what favors SN2. So for SN1, we want a poor or weak nucleophile, and we want a polar protic solvent, so it's a different solvent, and we want a secondary or tertiary leaving group. Okay, so it's a little bit different than SN2. So in terms of a poor nucleophile, if you look back on your nucleophile chart, we only have three that fall under weak nucleophiles. And so um, they were F minus, H2O, and then methanol was one of them. But it could be any solvent that's alcohol here. This can be any R group. In general, your nucleophile is your solvent, which is called a polar protic solvent. And um, in general, polar protic means you have OH or NH, but we're just going to focus on the OH as you see in these solvents here. So our polar protic solvents are going to have an OH, and remember that OH can hydrogen bond. We didn't want that for SN2, but we do for SN1. And if we focus on our substrate here, okay, this is our substrate, and our leaving group is chlorine. And so the water, or our solvent, can help the leaving group leave. And that's, that's a good match for SN1. What I just started with today is we want the leaving group to leave to form the carbocation. And if we can speed that up, we'll have a better SN1 reaction. And that's what's showing here. We require a, a tertiary or secondary leaving group. And the reason is, is because our intermediate that forms is a carbocation. So if our leaving group is tertiary and it leaves, it forms a carbocation that's tertiary and that's favored. In general, tertiary is better than secondary and reacts faster in terms of rate because a tertiary carbocation is more stable than secondary. And the other hint that you have SN1 is that you have heat. And heat could be written as a delta symbol um, on the reaction arrow. Okay, and so heat helps you overcome the step of the leaving group leaving. Before we get to some practice problems, why would we want SN2 over SN1? Because uh, we're learning both at this time. And so in general, SN2 is favored because the stereochemistry is inverted but not racemized. Remember, with SN1, you can get attack from either face of the carbocation. But for SN2, you always get inversion. And so it's a good way to prepare a molecule, and we can actually prepare a lot of different functional groups. So if our starting substrate has a primary or secondary halogen, so chloride, bromide, or iodide. So for example, here this would be a primary iodide. We can use all of these nucleophiles and form all of these different products. Now, in general, this, this one is a little tougher because this fell under our weak nucleophile. So let me just take that off so to prevent confusion. But we have hydroxide is a good nucleophile. RO- is just, in general, an alkoxide. This is called a thiol or a thiolate because it has a negative charge. 
And same here, so this is the carbon version, just like this is the carbon version of hydroxide. CN minus, we had learned that that's cyanide. We have an alkyne with a negative charge, that's called an acetylide. Amines, a nitrogen with three R groups. And then this last one here, we had learned when we talked about nucleophiles, is called an azide, is a good nucleophile. So if we kind of ignore this one, because it can be a little tricky at this stage too, you should be familiar with these other nucleophiles as, and these are the functional groups that result. And you should be able to take any of these and add them to any substrate, this primary or secondary leaving group, and be able to draw the products that result.